Welcome to Top Advisor Marketing, where you will learn how to become a prolific online influencer, attract more ideal clients, and grow your practice. Brought to you by Top Advisor Podcasting, a done-for-you podcasting solution built just for trusted advisors. And now, your co-hosts of Top Advisor Marketing, Kirk Lowe and Matt Halloran. Hello and welcome to another Top Advisor Marketing Podcast. You know, very rarely do I ever have the opportunity to do a live podcast with a human being that I'm actually looking at, which is making me a little bit nervous because Mark Mersman here, the chief marketing officer for USA Financial, is like in arms. I could almost reach, well, I could reach him, but that'd be creepy as all get out. I'm, I'm actually in their offices in uh, Ada, Michigan, uh, technically Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, USA Financial is an organization that we've been talking to about offering our services. And then I met Mark and realized, you know, he's actually like a really smart guy when it comes to marketing. So we wanted to get him on the podcast to pick his brain because he does all of the marketing for the financial services professionals that they work with at USA Financial. So Mark, welcome to the show, man. Good to be here. That's a lot of, that's a heck of a setup. And and I didn't even know when you, where you were going to go when you said, I'm live and I'm here. That made me a little nervous. Well, I'm trying to make you nervous. My goal as a podcast host is to make you as uncomfortable as possible. I Perfect. Think. So, yeah, did I work? Absolutely. Right, I'm good, ready. Good, let's good, do good. it. You should see he's like eight shades of red right now. <laughs> so anyway. All right. So let's talk about your history. Uh, before we get into you know really what you do here, how did you get to being the chief marketing officer for a, a large company like this? Sure. I've been here at uh, USA Financial for 15 years now. And prior to coming to USA Financial... I had a few different professional stops, and one of them was I, I worked for Red Bull, which is going to be an interesting discussion marketing-wise because I think that they have a, a fascinating approach to marketing. And then I also took a little stop as running my own financial planning firm. Hmm. And so I did that for a few years, and it just so happened that one day I was out seeking investment product for some clients, and I stumbled into USA Financial they happened to be in my right, um, right in my backyard, and I said, "I got to go check them out, see what they're all about." And lo and behold, here it is, 15 years later. I've been with the firm, uh, served in a few different capacities here, but have been the chief marketing officer now for about eight years. But it's it, it, and for me, marketing, I, I never studied formally, so it's all been consumed. I love consuming information, love consuming marketing, and trying to think about and look at how did this impact me? Did I take the action that they wanted me to take? And so that's really what drew me into the marketing side, you know, and obviously I had been in financial services, so it just fit. What do you do? I mean, so what do you, what have you seen that is really working for your advisors? So well, my role here is twofold. Uh, About 50% of it is serving the advisor base and helping them build out marketing programs and systems. The other part is obviously helping our firm, Mm -hmm. you know, find new advisors to work with us. And so that's essentially the two hats that I wear here. Okay. But specifically to answer your question, um, our firm has been engaged in a lot of different marketing things over the past 20 years. The number one tried and true thing that we've seen advisors do over the past 20 years It has been seminar marketing Mm -hmm. and workshop marketing, however you want to position it. Um, We've built out a system called the fill the room system, and that has been the workhorse for our advisors for 20 years. Now, I will tell you, a lot has changed in that arena over the past 20 years, and especially since I've been in this capacity for the past 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of change in terms of how advisors have to think about using that. And one of the biggest dangers that we see with it is that too many advisors get way too focused and ride that one horse. And unfortunately, if they aren't diverse with their marketing efforts and they don't have other things supporting the seminars that they're doing, they're ultimately going to be in a whole lot of trouble. And so a lot of like, and it's part of how we got introduced to you. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm always looking for what are other avenues that can support seminar marketing and be another conduit, another way for advisors to meet and demonstrate thought leadership. And so that's really, you know, the number one thing that we've seen over the past 10 to 15 years. And then, of course, you know, there's a lot of change in terms of how you have to approach the seminar marketing, filling the room, and what's the mindset and the topics that you're going to be talking well, I, about. Okay, so let's go right to that. Uh, what sort of changes have you guys seen that still allow you to fill the room? Because seminar marketing waxes and it wanes, right? I mean, there are times where 
it just, it, you kill it. And then there's other times where, uh, so you guys have to be flexible. Let's talk about what you've done there. So there's a few things to look at. The number one's the topic. What's, what's going to be, you know, you're, you're always looking for message to market match. So anything that you do marketing wise is, is message to market match. And oftentimes there are going to be certain messages that you have to change. I mean, I can tell you that the first 10 years of our program, our seminar didn't even change. It, it sure. hardly ever, it was the same thing. It was, and it worked. The marketing people, nothing about our system changed. And then all of a sudden, as more and more advisors started doing it and the needs of the consumers started to, to evolve, we needed to, to adapt. And so we'll typically see the need for a change in terms of the topic and, and what's really drawing and what are the, t- the hot buttons, usually once every year or two. And, yeah. and so we'll, oftentimes we'll see, you know, make evolutions to, like for us, the advisors we serve, the majority of them work with consumers 55 plus, mm-hmm. okay? So they're within five, 10 years of retirement or they're already in retirement. So that's the, the general consumer approach for, for the marketing that we're doing. And oftentimes we'll see in evolution if there was a stretch where social security and retirement income was the thing. And not that it still isn't drawing, but it isn't what it was five, six years ago, right? You look at, you know, you always want to try to find what is the, what's happening in the landscape of, from a governmental perspective. There was a a stretch where during the election time, we did a six month run with seminars focused on the election. And regardless of who wins, what does it mean for your retirement? Well, that's what's on everybody's mind. And so, you know, it's, it's actually fairly easy. You know, I get a lot of my content in terms of what we're going to introduce next, just by asking people in the segment, hey, what do you, when you go out to, what do you, when you go out to eat with your friends, what are some of the topics that you're talking about? And what are the things that are concerning you and that come up around the dinner table? And it's amazing when you actually just ask the question and you start listening, <laughs> all, all of a sudden a good idea comes out of it. And so the topic is one part of it. The other part is the delivery mechanism in terms of what are we going to use to actually fill the room? What's the marketing piece? What's going to be the hook? And that has evolved over the years a bit. A lot, obviously, now, as, as you well know, Matt, digital marketing is, is certainly making a big splash in terms of another ancillary way to fill the room. Now, is this research-based? I mean, besides the anecdotal evidence of you talking to you know people about, hey, what's going on, from a topic perspective, 100% in, as a marketer, listening is so underrated. Uh, very few people really do that, dude. It's a super frustrating, but, but you guys do research. I mean, this isn't just willy nilly stuff here when you're trying to fill the room and you're working with the invitations and all of that stuff. Talk to our audience about that. Please. We're control freaks. Good. Um, great. And, That's and awesome. The downside, it, it presents challenges, but the primary reason why we do that. And I, I can tell you that every single year, at least a half dozen different mail houses and companies come to try to earn our business. Mm -hmm. And it's no disrespect to any of them. They all do a great job. But for us, we want to control the data. I want to know, I want to be able to split test Mm -hmm. seminar topic titles, the bullet points that are going on. I want to be able to try a postcard versus a wedding style invite versus a Facebook invitation and all of a sudden track the metrics to say, how much did this actually cost me per butt in the seat? Mm -hmm. Because that at the end of the day, that's all that the advisor cares about. They're looking for how much did it cost me to put the qualified person in the room. And I can't, I, I, I never want an advisor to come to us and say, hey, what should I do? And me turn around and give them a choice between 14 different invitations. Because that's what a lot of people, that's what happens all the time in our industry. Because the natural question that the advisor is going to ask is, well, which one, which one of those 14 that's should I right. use? Absolutely. And I want to be in a point where I can say, here's the one that you should look at. And here's the reason why we split tested this. And, and so we're constantly doing that. Every, I can literally say one of, of every five of our seminars, we are split testing something okay. new. Oh, you got to pause. Our audience doesn't know what that means. So you're using a marketing term that I don't think is familiar with financial services. So explain what split test is, please. Okay. So we'll oftentimes have a control. All right. Well, and a control means it's a piece that we have a lot of data on. We understand what we should expect historically in terms of a response rate on that. Okay. And then I'm going to take another piece or two 
and I might change only one thing, and that's, that's really important when you're looking at split testing, you only want to change one thing. So it might be the title. It might be changing it, changing the color of a postcard. It might mm-hmm. be changing the picture on it. And any, every time we split test it, we track it with a different extension so that we know where the response came in from, and then we're going to look at it compared to our control okay. and say, did it do better? Did it do worse? Are we on to something here? And frankly, that is how we are evolving with any new pieces. And I can tell you that we usually will go through eight or nine pieces that get thrown away before we hit one. Oh, that beat the control. So that becomes a new one that we add to the arsenal. That's like a, a truly scientific, uh, you know, research-based approach. It, it, this isn't one of those things where, and I think a, a lot of companies like USA Financial might not share that as much as they should with our listeners specifically, because a lot of uh, marketing companies will say, um, well, yeah, we just do that. But right. but you taking the time to really explain. And, I, you know, when you look at the cost of, of seminars and filling the room specifically, what our advisors don't understand is there's a cost to the split <laughs> test, right? There's a yeah, big oh, yeah. cost to that. And you guys are making it so that they're going to be more successful, but that's part of what they're paying for. Yeah, and you know what? I I can honestly tell you the most important thing that we can do for our advisors, and I think this is true in terms of what advi- the most important thing advisors can do for their clients, and that is set a realistic range of expectation. And, you know, every single consumer, every single advisor that comes to us, their they're first, and you get this, their first question is, well, what should I expect ROI oh, wise on it. What's that what's just happened 20 minutes ago it, when we were talking to somebody. And huh? it's natural. We're yeah. conditioned, especially, you know, you're, you're spending good money to invest in this. And for us, I want to send, set a realistic range of expectations so that, you know, going in, Hey, based upon all of our data and here's, I'll, I'll share that data with you. I'll share the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we, mm-hmm. we point all of that out and we print it all out and we'll show you all of our statistics and open the raincoat to say, here's what we know and here's why we're making the recommendation that we're making. And sure. so I think the you know advisors can take a lesson from that too with their clients that you know at, at the end of the day a client isn't expecting 14%, 12%. You know what? Give them the realistic mm-hmm. range of expectations so that they can make the educated decision on it. And at the end of the day, as long as you, and, and they understand that you you can't provide guarantees always on on that sort of thing. I mean, marketing is a fickle beast sometimes and it can it, there are different parts of the country that respond differently to marketing. And in, in speaking to the split testing, though, Matt, I, one of the things that has made social media and, and Facebook kind of interesting and, and really intriguing marketing-wise is that it's a lot easier to, to do split testing and, and that sort of thing on, on there. And so it, it gives you a lot more flexibility, and it's kind of a marketer's dream when it comes to testing and tinkering on the fly really easily. Right, yeah. I mean, you can do A, B, C, D, E, F testing, yeah. uh, split tests on there. Now, you said something earlier that I don't want to gloss over. As a marketing company, you're saying things that just make me really happy. And one of them is message to market match. Yep. Okay, explain what you mean by that. Because I'm really <laughs> excited that that's something that you're talking about. So... I, this is a message and something that I try to drive home. It's something that I adhere to in every marketing that piece that I write and really try to stress this to the advisors, the assistance of advisors. And, and the first thing is, you know, you can write a great piece of copy, but if you send it to the wrong people, it's going to do nothing. And so there, you need to have the, you need to marry the two up. And oftentimes the biggest mistake that marketers make when they're writing copy is they try to write to an entire group. They try, so maybe they've narrowed down that group to 300 people even. That's a pretty narrow group, right? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to target, I'm going to write to 300 doctors that are orthopedic surgeon, whatever it is, whatever you've defined that. All right, we've now defined the market. Now we got to get the message right. Most people try to write that message to appeal to 300. So when they're writing it, they write it to the group of 300. The easiest and most important thing that you can wait to get through that and change it is to pick one person in that group of 300. And if it's Joe Smith, I'm going to write my letter to Joe Smith. And I'm going to be thinking about Joe as though I'm writing him an individual piece of marketing and a letter to us just to Joe. And then once you're done with that, you back out 
you take Joe's name out of it and say, would everybody in that group of 300 actually feel as though this was being written directly to them? That's so valuable, dude. And you're right. The advisors are, it's that old economy of scale philosophy, right? <laughs> it's the rule of tens, right? I'm going to get 10,000 phone numbers. I'm going to call every single solitary one of them. I'm going to maybe connect with a hundred people and that's going to get me 10 pieces of business, mm -hmm. right? That's not, things have really changed. Now, oh, yeah. it, it, scaling is great. And that's why I happen to be a big fan of seminars. Um, you know, we've grown our company by speaking, podcasting, and social media. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what you, I mean, yeah. you have your own podcast. Uh, b before we get too far in, what is your podcast? So the name of my podcast is 16 Ways from Sunday. And we actually talk about a lot of the same topics in mm -hmm. terms of it is marketing focused for financial advisors. And, you know, we approach things very similarly in terms of how you and I host our podcasts. Yep. You're probably smarter with how you've named your podcast. Mine being 16 Ways from Sunday is one of the craziest names out there. And it it has a really stupid story behind how I arrived at it. But I, one day I was in a consulting session with an advisor and I just kind of blurted out to him, ah, yeah, we can do this or that, or really we can do it 16 Ways from Sunday. And he looked at me and said, that's not even how the saying goes, is it? <laughs> And I said, no, it isn't, but you know what I meant. Yes, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so at that point, I mean, the, the whole argument and the whole reason for why I did it was we're trying to explore marketing from every angle possible. Sure. That's really Well, it. I love, and, and I've said this on many, many podcasts before, and I will continue to say this. When you start your own podcast, when you meet other people who podcast, they're your same kind of crazy. Oh, yeah. Right? And so, like, I totally, well, you know, I, I wanted you to be on the podcast because you're a known commodity to me now. Like, I can go listen to your podcast. I'm like, okay, Mark, yeah, Mark knows what he's doing. So I'm not as nervous. I, I, I made it? Uh, you did. You really did. I you made, made the it. cut, dude. You really did. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's a, it's, it's a brutal do I, cut. Do I get a top I'll, advisor you, marketing award? I'll totally award? make you an award, dude. That's no problem. Uh, I've always wanted an award named after me, if we can go that far. Uh, yeah. That's going to cost you a lot of money, <laughs> but we, we can talk about that offline. Um, Fair so, <laughs> um, okay. Now, if somebody wants to work with you, okay, so they've heard you, they felt your passion, which if you haven't, you're not paying attention. They felt your passion. They, they've noticed that you actually understand you got marketing chops, buddy, right? So you, you get the game. Sure. You've tested the game. What do you offer? I mean, so, so if somebody's going to like, oh, what is this USA financial thing? What? How, who, who should engage with you? Right. What should they expect from you? And then we're going to get to know who you are personally, but, but it's a good time for us to talk about. So that. The, the easiest way to answer that is to really look at breaking it down between what we do and how we get paid. So what USA financial does is we, we ultimately support advisors in, a, in, in the various capacities within their practice that they need support. Things like marketing, things like compliance, things like wealth management, things like investment management, portfolio management, case design, practice management, brand management. All, all of those things are fundamentally what we do. Now, how we get paid, we operate a broker-dealer. We operate two independent RIAs, a, a turnkey asset management program, a money manager, a, an insurance brokerage company. That's how we get paid, but we look at those things as the commodity part mm -hmm. of it. And, and frankly, we know that we have competitors in each, each one of those different silos. But for us, it's the value that we can bring to an advisor has little to do with the, the product and the investment offering that exists and how we get paid through those channels. And it has way more to do with, can we help increase the value of an advisor's business? Sure. And we do e everything in our power to put our emphasis on if your valuation in your firm is X amount of dollars today, how do we make it X plus Y tomorrow? And what can we surround you with to help you ultimately accomplish that? When I met with you the first time and, and did my due diligence when we were, were talking about working together potentially, sure. I think the thing that made me super happy was you're a, literally a one-stop shop. Like everything a financial advisor needs to be successful, you offer. And that is not a normal business model, right? We know that, right? Everybody's right. niched themselves on how we talk about niches all the time, but you have niches within niches, right? Wasn't that a Dr. Seuss? <laughs> no, that was snitches and sneetches. Anyway, um, but, uh, but I love how you guys have packaged everything here because an advisor can come in and 
talk to lots of different people here and have right. their solutions met. Yeah, and, and one of the big focuses, and I, it sounds really cliche, but one of the most important things to us is relationship. Mm -hmm. And by having the various entities under the roof and the, the more affiliations that our advisors have with those different entities, the deeper our relationship is able to be with them. And the more invested we can become in their growth, in their personal lives. And at the end of the day, that's really what matters. Um, and so, you know, we certainly have advisors that work with just one or two of our entities, and mm -hmm. then we have others that plug in more. And I mean, frankly, I can, I can tell you the, the relationships that are the deepest are the ones that we work with them across the, across the board. And, you know, that's, a, that's our ideal client. I mean, mm -hmm. if we're going to paint the picture for who's the type of client you want to work. And it's really, when, when advisors hear that, and then when they start to equate it into their own practice, think about who your ideal client is, right. who's your ideal investor client. Well, it's the one that empowers you fully. It's the one that, you know, tr trusts you enough to give you all of their portfolio and all of their insurance business and, and is going to call you when their phone bill went up because, and you know, the crazy ridiculous stuff that really, do you really even deal with as an advisor? But it, our business model is no different. We want the clients that the advisor clients that empower us and that trust us and in, in, in turn, we can go to bat for them. And, and especially nowadays in the highly regulated industry that we're in, the, the fact of the matter is who we end up doing business with and who you as an advisor end up doing business with, you're tied at the hip oh, yeah. regulatorily with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'd better, you'd better like them. You'd better appreciate them. You better have a good understanding of who they are and, and what their values truly are. You know, one of the neat things about coming here today was we had lunch with a, a firm yeah, and I got to see what I really don't get to see very often, which is guys like you from a company like this interacting with a client. Right. And it wasn't just a client, it was a whole freaking firm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with multi-generational stuff going on and all of that stuff. And it was so comfortable. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it was like, we were just sitting around having lunch and it was just a bunch of people talking about stuff that they were passionate about. And yeah. And it, yes, should there be formality? And I know you have that, but you personally, as, as you know, the chief marketing officer here, and just as a human being, I find that wildly refreshing because you know your stuff, but you're still, you still want to have that real relationship. I think a lot of people gloss over that, like, oh, we're going to provide you with great service and stuff. But like, you knew stuff about this dude's family and what he does for fun and I mean, I've it, been to Vegas with them. We've had, I mean, we've been on trips together yeah. and, and it's like, honestly, business isn't worth doing unless you're uh, able to I have agree with fun that, with yeah. the people that you're doing it with. And unless you can align morally and, you know, there's values and, mm -hmm. and frankly, they're the type of people that you'd want to go out and have dinner with sure. or have, I mean, there is, life's way too short to do business with people that you don't like. That's right. And so structure your business in a way that, Let's make it all about who I want to do business with, and that's who I want to partner with, and your life is going to be a heck of a lot more enjoyable. <laughs> well, and speaking of that, so so to wrap up today's podcast, we like to get to know who you are as a human being because we know that people like to do business with people they like and have things in common with, right? Sure. So when you're not working, uh, well, okay, this is going to be a loaded question with recent life events for you, but uh, <laughs> when you're not working, what do you do for fun? Well, I have three little girls, uh, one that is, as of today, about actually three weeks old, um, the other two are age four and five. So they, they keep me crazy busy. I'm the father of three darling, cute little blonde girls, and I'm in a lot of trouble. So for the next 15 years of my life, I will be figuring out how to shelter them from going out in the real world and Good meeting boys that, and all that. Yeah. <laughs> so that will become my, my new hobby. Um, but beyond that, I live on a lake, so I love getting out on the boat and, and goofing around on the water. Um, that's a big passion of mine, the outdoors. I've always been a big uh, softball, baseball player, basketball player. So those are kind of the hobbies when when I'm not with the kiddos and the wife and hanging around. And obviously, family's mission critical. Um, but at, at, at the same time, uh, I'm a big – I went to Michigan State. So I'm a, I'm a big Michigan State football and basketball fan. So I follow, uh, follow that. And that's oftentimes the weekends where you'll find me camped out either – 
at the stadium or mm. watching a game. Well, much suck watching them lose so many times. Oh, <laughs> wow. I'm sorry. I'm not huh. a sports fan, but I just thought I'd get you. Uh, my family is a big U of M fan. I, I don't care. Hey, we all way. have our faults. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but you bleed green and that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, who's your hero? Matt Halloran. Oh, God. Um, I met Dear him. God. I met him a little while ago. Oh, the and... sunshine. It's getting deep. In here, <laughs> um, who's my hero? <sighs> you know, I, that's a really good question. This is going to sound really weird. I'm going to say my brother who passed away. And it's, you know, in exactly the reason that in a way that he shouldn't be my hero, he battled drug and alcohol addiction and had a lot of, a lot of troubles centered around that. And I saw the fight that he fought over and over and over again. And in many ways, he, in, in what has, what had happened with him and transpired with him and that sort of thing, taught me and shaped me into be the person that I am. And so as, as much as, you know, he probably wouldn't be the typical person in terms of who some of the decisions that he made would, you'd think this is my hero, but I look at, at somebody who's a, that's a hero to somebody is ultimately they help to mold you in terms of who you are and who you've become and you know, to establish the values that, you know, sure. somebody that taught you something that you learned from. Sure. Who's your favorite person in history? Um, I'm going to go with Socrates. I'm a, I'm a, I have a philosophy, I have a philosophy degree. And so really? I studied, so you, um, you and I both have the two most worthless degrees. <laughs> Are you a psychology? I, I, no, actually, well, I'm, I'm philosophy <laughs> and communication. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So <laughs> Well, fair I, enough. Congratulations. It's so yeah. nice to meet a fellow uh, philosophy <laughs> student. That's insane. Yeah, so I, Socrates. Okay, and and I'm, I'm, a big, I'm, a, I'm a big Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato fan. Mm-hmm. So, But Socrates started it all. So when it comes down to it, that's the Socratic method is what it is. So your wife loves it when you argue with her. You know what? I, 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 I do everything I can to avoid <laughs> infusing yes. that. In, in infusing my background in yeah. philosophy into my wife and I's relationship. Oh. I'll use it in a lot of other places, but not there. I, yeah. I try to curb it there. Boy, I need to learn from you on that one there, brother. Cause, uh, <laughs> my wife will say, okay, you're not arguing the point right now. You're arguing the <laughs> argument. I'm yes. like, damn it, she got it again. <laughs> okay. Uh, so history, that's fantastic. When, uh, when you define the word success, define what that means to you. And then how will you know when you've achieved that in life? Joy. Something that that is sustainable, something that is long lasting, something that is ever present, and you know it, it's. I think that people are constantly seeking out the next level of success. So, like, I, I don't think that for for most of us, we'll never, especially hard chargers, you never actually achieve mm-hmm. success. Mm-hmm. I mean, because the second you get where you think you're you're there. There's that next plateau that you're climbing towards, right? So for me, it's about finding that joy to find that that everlasting peace that says, you know something, I, I can look around and have peace with everything that I have and be confident and to know that I have enough. Hmm. And and I think knowing that you have enough is something that is a a really difficult thing that most people never get to oh, man, understand. Brother. I absolutely, and especially in our industry. Yeah. You know, I can't tell you how many times people would say to me, well, Matt, I'll be happy when I make 1.5 million. Mm-hmm. Then we get to 1.5 million and they're like, nah, I'm going to be happy when I make 2 million. Really, yep. dude, seriously, just be happy with what you have. Yeah. All right. Final question. Actually, no, I have two. So second to the last question, what is your go-to thing that you give to people? So like, you know, it could be a book, it could be a TED talk, it could be a song. Like you always find yourself giving your friends and family these things. Uh, the thing that I probably share the most is uh, Simon Sinek's. TED Talk and start with why. Um, I mean, it's because I think it's very foundational to get people thinking a little differently about, you know, how they approach who they are, their brand, their company, how they are, they, how they communicate with the outside world. So that's probably the one that I've pointed out the most, sent the most, you know, in terms of, Hey, spend 15 minutes. Cause I, I love giving out books and I love receiving books, but I know that the vast majority of people take that book and put it somewhere else and never read it. Yeah. They can, most people can stomach 15 minutes of a video. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the, the final question is what is your mantra or motto? Something that you say to yourself when you are a little off track and you need to recenter yourself. So this, this stems 
Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. The last part you, you, you threw back at me. But my favorite quote in the world, and this is something that I remind myself of all the time, is the greater the continent of knowledge, the longer the shore of mystery. Mm. And the, the, the reality is once you really understand what the heck that means, you know, the, the more that you know, the, the bigger the body of knowledge that you gain, the more you realize, I don't know. I have no idea what the hell is going on yeah. out there. And I have to remind myself of that a lot because it, it, this happens all the time with ideas. I, you get one idea and then it spurns five other ideas. And then you're like, oh, but I need to learn so much more about how to execute all. And that's part of what will cause some paralysis sometimes. So sometimes it's like, all right, just be happy with the continent you got for now. Let's cultivate that continent that we have. And not that you want to stop learning, but understand that there are limitations and you know, every time you learn more, it's it's going to compound the problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, Bruce Lee had said, you know, be like water. Uh, and he talks about, you know, you don't want to be a glass that's entirely full ever. You consistently want to empty that so that you can always find a way to fill it up with more water. Sure. And that's, I, I love that. Uh, yeah, man, I don't know anything. I mean, my <laughs> wife will tell you that too, by the way, but that's for different reasons. Okay. Uh, if you don't want to at least have a conversation with this man, you're a little off. So I want people to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you to find out a little bit more about what happens at USA Financial and what you can do for them. What are the best ways for them to reach out to you? Uh, well, the easiest, if you want to just keep getting in touch with me and staying following me, is to, to subscribe to the podcast, 16 Ways from Sunday. That's, you know, if, if you're hesitant to at least reach out directly, hey, we'd love to have you as a, as a follower there. Um, beyond that, I'd be happy to, to have you shoot me a note. Uh, the, the email address is mmersman at usafinancial.com. Certainly have you reach out and put you in, in touch with a member of the business development team here. You know, really what we do at USA Financial, for those that are interested and think, ah, maybe I want to check this, this group out, we would fly you out to our office, spend a day with you, give you kind of the the, the chance to really focus in on you, what are the biggest concerns within your practice, see if there are any areas that our team could bring value to you, and then you fly home, get a chance to evaluate, hey, is this something that I, I agree with or not? And, you know, there's there's no locked doors, no contracts to sign, no nothing. There's no financial obligation. Uh, it's a, just a chance for, we call it our discovery day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you learn a little bit more about us, and we cater that day to you and your practice and, you know, basically it gives you a chance to find out this a group that I might have a, have a connection with. And it's really as simple as that. It's pretty, pretty informal and pretty, you know, pretty laid back. We're, as you saw, we're fun people. For yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So we'll make sure that we have links to your podcast. And also we're going to put your email address in our show notes to make sure that people can just click right on that and, and go ahead and fire you off a quick email. Perfect. So Mark, thank you for being on the show. Hey, thank you, sir. Anytime. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you click that subscribe and all button below. That way, every time we come out with a new podcast, we'll show up directly on your listening device. And if you have not shared this podcast with your other financial advisor friends or family or whatever, you know, make sure you just click that subscribe now button and that share button. Now, if you wouldn't mind, I would really, really appreciate for you to take a moment to give us a rating on iTunes and any comments you have. We read those regularly. In fact, that's one of the main reasons why we are coming up with the topics and we've been doing more and more mini series because we have heard from you that you really, really like that. And if you have any questions or topic suggestions or guest suggestions for us at Top Advisor Marketing, all you have to do is email me at matt at topadvisorm and that M is for marketing.com. Thank you very much for listening. For everybody at USA Financial, Mark Merson, and all of us here at Top Advisor Marketing, we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Are you ready to change the way you communicate with your clients? Are you tired of being the best kept secret in your area? Learn how to become a prolific online influencer, attract more ideal clients, and grow your business. Contact us today and see what the power of podcasting can do for your business. Click on the Contact Us link on our website at topadvisormarketing.com and set up a call to learn more. Follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook for more updates and information. This was brought to you by iris.xyz, a platform helping financial professionals become better in business and life through new media and new voices. Visit them and learn more at iris.xyz.